Thank you so much, Osnet, and a huge welcome to everybody around the screen and from around the world. Our Pass It Down network is growing and is very healthy. <laughs> I'd just like to mention for those of you who are here for the very first time, just a little introduction to who we are and what we do. So the Pass It On network is a grassroots network, and we advocate for the rights of older people around the world. And we also advocate for the adaptation of our societies to the new demographics, to the growing number of older people and what society needs to do in order to cope with this and make itself a society for all ages. And that is very much, very, much, very important. So the Pass It Down Network was started um, in 2013 by uh, Jan Hively and myself in 2013. And the whole idea of Pass It On is that we all have experience and we all have knowledge and we all have wisdom. And the idea of passing it on is to pass it on and to make that live on as we go. So the Pass It On Network is very proud of the fact that we have people who follow us and who are in, with, members with us in more than 60 countries around the world. And that is, I think, one of the great attractions of our network because people enjoy hearing what's happening in other parts of the world because the phenomenon that we are interested in, aging, is a worldwide phenomenon. So we are a member, a member organization. It's very unique because members don't have to pay any fees. <laughs> so that's not a very good idea for us, but that's the way it is. We very much welcome you to sign up for a free subscription to our newsletter, which is called the Pioneer Gazette. And just a word about Pioneer. You know, our name is Pass It On Network which when you try to say it in its acronym form, is quite horrible. It's peon or pion. So we've adapted more and more the whole idea of saying capital letters, P-I-O-N, and then E-E-R, pioneer, because we do all feel that we are pioneering a very new stage of this world. So our actions are the Gazette, our 50-50s, which are monthly and always recorded and now Form a substantial block of um, videos on our special YouTube channel. We have open houses uh, once a month for people who want to know more about the Pass It On Network. And um, apart from that, we're very, very happy to hear from you because that's the whole nature of the organization, to exchange and to hear from you. And the, we've recently done, as you've seen, surveys, and I'm now going to pass it on to Osnat, who's the architect of these surveys. And Osnat, tell us what came out of this last one, which was absolutely fascinating on the intergenerational aspect of plus 60s. Yes, uh, very fascinating. Well, first of all, welcome. Welcome to this uh, October 5050 session. If you remember some of you who were on that mailing list, which is probably most of you, back in September, we sent around a survey to all of our pioneers. Uh, it's actually the first time we've done this. Uh, it was prompted by a chance encounter this past summer, back in July, when uh, I joined the Pion co-founders, Jen Hively and Moira Allen for a couple of days of reflection and celebration. It was a really memorable uh, occasion. And as we were speaking about what brought us to this present time, present moment, we realized that uh, our perspectives are actually sitting or standing on three different peaks, um, you know, generational peaks. Each one of us sees progressively further and Jan sees it from her 93 years height and Moira from 78 years height and me from the lowest 68. And we were wondering how similar uh, was this experience to others along this general dist gen generational distribution. So we asked and we sent around a few informal questions and waited a few days 
and um, and then this magic happened. But before we get there, I'd like to uh, set a brief general context. And for that, I'm going to share PowerPoint. This is a shocking graph. Uh, it was shocking to me. I didn't realize it. That in 1950, the world only had two and a half billion people. And in November, actually the 15th of November, 2022, it reached 8 billion. This is um, uh, exponential growth. Today, we're about 200 million above that. So in fact, the world population has tripled over 72 years from 2.5 billion to 8.1 billion. And this has never seen before growth is thanks to the gradual increase in human life expectancy, uh, that we see better public health practices, better nutrition, and better access to healthcare. Um, most of that growth, by the way, is happening in the uh, in the countries of the Sub-Saharan uh, Sub Africa. Uh, this is where a little created a huge improvement and um, including a decrease of child mortality and increase of uh, life expectancy. So this is a trend we're going to see for a while until the middle of the century. Okay. Now, this is another thing, another point of view. If we go back to the global look, uh, global view, this is an age distribution between 1950 and 2024. The pink is women, the blue is men. And uh, on the uh, left hand, you see a bar that shows ages. And uh, the pyramids themselves show the uh, percentage of the population in that age group. So what we're seeing when the world was only two and a half billion people, uh, the percentage of people under 20 or under 30 was quite big. Now, 72 years later, uh, we're seeing that most of these people grew up and were not replaced by enough uh, young people. In fact, that slice has gone uh, down. So today, the um, the population is getting much older by comparison to uh, 1950. So what we're seeing now is that the by 2050, this is the the trend. The people, the number of people over 65 and older will be exploding. And I think another the important point to note is that. People in their 60s and 70s may well lead economically active and financially self-reliant uh, lives in the foreseeable future, at least until uh, 2050. The same is not for those who are 80 and older. And if you look, uh, if you can imagine what this pyramid will look like in uh, 2050 with this trend of uh, uh, fewer young people, the super old are the world's fastest growing cohort. Which brings us back to today. Today, there are 1.2 billion people that are between the ages of 60 to 100. 1.2 billion people. Um, just to break it down a little bit, there is a close to 1 billion of people between the ages of 60 and 80. There's about 150 million between 80 and 100. And for now, just about a, um, about a half a million or 600,000 people over the age of 100. But this is growing up. And then I think to me, when I saw this pyramid, the, the thing that uh, struck me is that 1.2 billion people is not a homogeneous group. It's 15% of the world population. 15% of the world population. You wouldn't consider people age zero to 40 as a homogeneous group, right? So why would you do the same for people 60 to 100? And are there any variations 
within this, like they are between for the people between zero to 40. So today we'd like to think together about what we found out uh, and what we could do about it as individuals in our local communities about that uh, one, the voice of 1.2 billion people is 60 to 100. And so um, taking a cue from Jan, Moira and me, we divided that span from 60 to 100 plus to sub age groups with 60 to 74, 75 to 89 and 90 plus. You can call it arbitrary. It's just made sense because we uh, reflected back to who we are today. And um, yes, in chat, maybe you can maybe you can just put in chat if you see any generational differences in character, in behavior, in in markings, in in identity uh, expression between 60, the, the first group, the second group, and the last group. Just in chat very quickly, I know we asked it also in the survey, but why not? Let's ask it again here. So if you look around at these age groups in your community, in your life, do you see any um, differences in how these each generation expresses their identity? And while you're doing that, I will move on to what we asked in the survey. So thank you all who answered that. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly on, on uh, these questions and then go into what you said. We, the same question I just asked you and asked you to uh, put it in chat. We wanted to know if you ever notice, if you even noticed uh, uh, that there are any subgenerations and if they are, how do they express their identity? The second question we asked was about intergenera intergenerational interactions. How do in interactions between people in different age groups, those three age groups, compare to their interactions within those age groups? So is a 60-year-old and a 90-year-old interact differently than a 60-year-old with another 60-year-old? The third, uh, theme was about support, collaboration, and learning. We wanted to know how people from different age groups, those three age groups, use their skills and accumulated experience to support or collaborate with each other, with other great age groups, or within the same age group. And the last one was about well-being. How do the intergenerational interactions impact the personal growth and well-being of the people involved? So these were the four questions. And, and this is what we heard. Um, the 45 people responded. And this is uh, what it looked like by age group. We had uh, the 75 to 89, there were 24 respondents, 60 to 74, 17 respondents, and younger than 60, were four respondents, but four means a lot in here, and you're going to see it in a moment. We also, because we are the Pasto network, we reach the world, and this this was actually um, it's so balanced. We got ten responses from Africa, we got twenty responses from America and Australia, and we got fourteen responses from Europe. Altogether, what you see here are 22 countries. Uh, we feel that for an informal and non-scholarly survey, uh, this is a very, very diverse and uh, remarkable outreach. And each response was fascinating in its own way and was really hard to uh, decide how to slice and analyze it and, and it was it was quite a i'm sure there are other ways to do it and we chose to do it um, in a particular way we decided to take these three regions and see what they told us 
So let's look at the key findings. Here are the key findings. There are eight of them, and we're going to start with number one. This came out hmm, very, very strongly. One of the things that stood out very clearly was that many in this age range reject defining themselves by the chronological age. We're more than our age. We define ourselves based on our health, attitudes, interests, and other attributes. The second findings um, was around generational identity. How do you describe the markers of a subgeneration? Uh, it was a very much tied to age group and, the, and its respondents. Younger respondents tended to be more general with one extreme, and I'm quoting, people over 60 look old and they are old. Uh, the older respondents provided more distinct details related to their life experience. And with 22 countries across three continents, we identified universal themes in aging experience as well as regional ones. For example, uh, one universal theme would be the emergence of health and mobility challenges among the oldest age groups. Uh, some of the regional variations related to culture and the place of older people in society. Another connection, uh, around connection, health was once again claimed its place as a shared experience and technical literacy and access to tech uh, diminished for the older age groups. Sometimes it led to breaking communication, and in other times, it led to learning opportunities. No surprise, when people connect and engage, regardless of their situation, it has positive effect on their age and their health and attitudes. Support, collaboration, and learning went both ways from younger to older and from older to younger. In the, the latter example, from older to younger, sharing what it is like to be in the upper end of one's lifespan was a way to help younger people get prepared for the future. Again, there were certain universal differences between age groups, some related to comfort with technology, evolving needs for physical support, and perception of the societal role. Olders are seen more passive than younger. And finally, uh, there were regional distinctions that could be explained by different factors, economical, political, cultural, and others, and summarized as uh, in response, responses from Africa, there was a, a community focus, Europe in general focused on individual growth and learning, and in the Americas, the focus was primarily on active aging. So where are we? So our survey highlighted that when it comes to creating policies and services for older adults, we need to hear from everyone, especially the older adults themselves. Here's where, where it gets interesting. The more, act, the more active younger olds are in a great position to advocate for their peers, especially those who might have trouble getting around. It, it always seems to come down to vitality and well-being and to others' perception of these factors in you. By bringing a range of older voices to the table, we don't let the discussion stop at the chronological age. We're also considering cultural backgrounds and personal situations. And what happens as a result? Solutions that could really work for our aging communities, making sure everyone feels included and supported. This survey wasn't just about gathering information. It's about taking action. And that's our call to action to you. Pasto Network is committed to creating a world where every generation's voice is heard and valued. As you can see here, four points. Include all voices, especially those who find it hard to make themselves heard. Unleash active younger all to advocate for older people and creating a just and supportive policy, policies and services. 
So what's your next action? Okay, three questions in the chat. And we're gonna go into breakout rooms for 12 minutes, very small groups. And you can use these questions or you can uh, use uh, anything else that came up for you in this spirit. The questions are, what can younger olds, 60 to 74, how can, in what ways they can advocate for the older olds in policy discussions? The second question is, as you move from one age group to the next, what type of adaptation do you want to see in public or communal support systems? And the third question is, how can we design policies that address both cultural differences and common needs across the 60 plus age groups? Just before yes. we break out. Yes. Your definition of the younger olds being 60 to 74, yeah. I appreciate why you're using that. But what about those of us who are older olds, as you can as you call them, but consider ourselves to be younger olds? It's an excellent point, Adele, and I encourage you to uh, include it in the conversation. My definitions are not gospel. My definitions are uh, providing a framework that can be broken to little pieces with any good argument. Everybody's coming back with big smiles on their faces. I think it's fabulous. <laughs> well, clearly we solved the problem of the world, all of them. <laughs> if we could. But, yeah. yeah. You know, but before we continue, I just wanted to address a question that Sheila posed in the chat. Uh, you asked uh, how many people over 100 there are. So today, 2024, there are 550 um, a thousand, 550,000. By 2050, if nothing changes in the, in our world, they're expected to have one and a half million. Over a hundred. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So three times uh, the population oh. of uh, people over a hundred. Uh, that is if, you know, global warming and everything else uh, uh, what does it, uh, wars, etc. doesn't do anything. Um, and uh, the, the one other thing that I wanted to mention is that we're not expecting any more exponential growth of population no. as we did between 1950 and 2022. Uh, between now and 2050, it's very moderate and uh, it has to do with uh, all the conditions that I mentioned before, uh, that there's fewer new people being born and longevity uh, keeps older people alive and well, as we're going to speak about in a moment. And uh, it, somewhere around 2050, 2060, the population, the world population will reach something around 10 billion, and then it will level off and start to decline just the way it is. And it means that we, mean, we might need to adapt. So adapting, looking at what, where we are now, how can we look into the future? Uh, what are some things in your conversations that were important to share with the whole group? What came up for you that could uh, expand our view on, on the 60 plus? Yes. We did. Uh, we were we were three in the group: uh, Sophie from Oregon and and uh, Beatrice uh, from Zimbabwe, and I think we all agreed on age is 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 not uh, uh, what matters. Age that it's the health and uh, activity and everything. I think we all agreed on that. That's that, that was our our um, our uh, uh, yeah common 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 view. But we were thinking of what a, there is one age that de defines a lot of things, and that is the retirement age. And uh, the retirement age uh, that that might be uh, the, the the age where your life starts to change, or, or that's that's uh, I think Sophie was was uh, mentioning mentioning this. 
but I think we agreed on on uh, that uh, yeah. people uh, uh, below seventy can help people over eighty. People over eighty can help people over sixty or something like that. I mean, it does not really depend on your age whether you are are, are fit and 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 apt to to uh, uh, help your uh shall we say your your uh, co uh older what what i maybe maybe say that that i am of the the um, the um, uh, opinion that retirement age is something that should not be fixed and you should never be forced into retirement but this is different in different systems different culture etc i think i stop this now Yeah, thanks, Hans. Uh, Catherine, would you like to go? Sure. And by all means, Michelle and, and um, Han chime in if I don't if I don't include everything. The first question, which is really that there was an underlying assumption that somehow the group that was the younger one up to age 74, which we disagreed with since we were all older than that and didn't feel we were old. Um, so we're agreeing with the first uh, comment that it really isn't chronological. But why is there an assumption that we need someone to speak on our behalf? I think it's really important not to have that, that, that what we have been advocating globally is no one speaks for us. And I think that goes for age groups as well. So no matter what your health condition is, you usually can identify what you need and what you can contribute. So that was question number one. We also agreed that um, retirement, Han had a great way. He said, it's not retire, but refire. And it was about the three of us anyway, agreeing that we are busier now, more active than most of us were in our paid <laughs> life, and that people who don't get paid for jobs, particularly housewives, it would be unfair to call them that they somehow are not valuable. So we didn't like the idea of either retirement or of it being attributed to any kind of a, an amount of money. I think that was it. Michelle or Han, do you want to add anything? That's okay. Michelle, no, go I, ahead. I, yeah, I, I don't think so. I think you've you summarized, you know, what we what we discussed. That uh, you know, <clears throat> we're, we're we're not our chronological age by any means. I think that was. Yeah. And Vicky, what about your group? Um, yes, in my group we had Isaac, Linda, and Moira. And we talked about what is it, each country has a different set of policy rules, different culture, different government. Um, and so what we concluded is that your voice has to be heard. There was a lot of used to. Um, uh, I think it, Lin, Linda talked about in South Africa, she was in Brussels or and learned that they had a sort of an aging group that was put in place and then poof, it went away. In America, we used to have a Department of Aging or a, 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 a cabinet position on aging. Poof, that went away. So when poof, we go away as older adults, how do we represent ourselves? And it's called speak up, speak out, advocate and make your voices heard. Every other group does, and I agree with our discussion that we had earlier that we are too polite and too silent. I'm a product of the 1960s from the University of Wisconsin. We were not silent. And I'll tell you, depending upon how our election goes, we will not be silent. We may be shot, but we will not be silent. So we believe that you have to advocate you have to be able to have money to be able to do that, to be able to have your voices heard, to be able to speak up and to collectively represent aging as what are our needs 
as we go from 60 to 90. Hmm. Was Nat, I think Sheila's trying to put up her hand, her real hand. Go ahead, Sheila. There we go. Um, our group felt that we represent ourselves and uh, that the, I think it was indicated maybe by Adele that uh, there's some ageism among the younger group, the 60 plus group. I personally feel that we are the ones who are responsible for changing that by our behavior as was just uh, said by the previous speaker here. Uh, the other thing that we forget about, I show films on aging um, at different uh, periods of time, 60 year old, 80s, 90s, 100s, so on and so forth. But one thing we haven't spoken about is the number of people who have Alzheimer's disease and how often that comes up in the press, in films and so forth. And that's something we have to think about, even though we're doing, I'm 86 and I'm doing okay, although I did have a stroke, so I'm not walking very well these days, but so far the brain's doing okay. But um, there are definite changes and we are the representatives and we have to show the world what we do and speak out and not only speak out, but act out. That's all I have to say. I, I wanted to uh, respond to what something that Vicky said. Um, one of the things that uh, came out, out out of our survey was that there's health health issues and mobility issues of people who are older, and as well noted, <laughs> it's not defined by age, but it's something that does happen that people have. Many people have less mobility, less able to uh, bring their voice to the public uh, domain, is that younger olds, however you define yourself, can take that voice, can identify these needs and bring them into the uh, uh, policy and services arena because the older olds cannot. So when we say we want to make every voice heard, it is... The responsibility of a responsibility of a younger person to understand what are the concerns of the older people uh, that cannot have their voice heard and bring this to the bring it to the table. Otherwise, as Vicky said, the people who uh, shout loudest—that's my my words, not yours—are uh, going to be heard, and the people who do not have a voice will not be heard. And we are in that cohort of 60 plus, and we need to take care of the people of the entire range of that cohort. So, Ingen. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I was in a group with uh, Bob and Richard, and I think we agree with, you know, everyone else that uh, age is not, or the, the, you know, the age cohort is not so much related to uh, chronological age but that is more you know who you are and what you can still do and etc there's 87 year olds who do a lot of great things while uh, we have 40 years old who are already old um, as far as for me personally and um, I think it's very important uh, to include the even younger generations um, because, you know, in, uh, also with, in, in my women organization, we talk a lot, lot about allies. Uh, I think we need to, we are looking at an issue and challenges that uh, includes a lot of people and not just the older people. We need to, uh, to include those uh, whose 
uh, future we are creating, you know, they are, if we don't solve this problem, and, they, and this is what they need to be aware of, if we don't um, really work on this challenge together with the younger generations, then they are going to look at a huge, huge issue in a couple of years. And, you know, you hear the numbers about, you know, how many hundred years old and how many, so many years old. Um, those first pictures that you showed in the slides, in your slide deck, those pictures need to be something that uh, everyone should uh, should see and everyone should be able to act on uh, because it's their future. Thank you, Ingen. Ingen, that that, that uh, feeds directly into and and Lyle and Joyce will get to you in a second. Uh, in the chat, there is a question from Isaac, and he's talking exactly about what you were just speaking about. How do you how do you foreplan, foresee uh, what is the what is your future uh, based on what you can learn from today's present? And uh, maybe after Lyle and Joyce speak, we can go back to that. And Isaac, maybe you, uh, at that point, you can actually come on online and, and speak about it. So Lyle, and then Joyce, and then Isaac. Thank you, Isaac. Just picking up on Hans's comments on retirement and countries having different systems. In New Zealand, some time ago, they abolished the official age of retirement. And we have a lot of older people in the workplace. There is still ageism, and often their skills aren't recognised as, as much as they should be, and certainly neither is their experience. But I, I do like some of the phrases like, uh, would help perhaps abolish or um, downgrade the word retirement. I like the refire comment someone made. I use retire spelt R-E-T-Y-R-E -E, in terms of getting some new tread on the tire and trying new things. But I think one thing we can do in, in that, that intergenerational older dynamic that the survey related to was encourage more people to be brave and strike out and start quite new things when they leave so-called formal retirement, perhaps working for others. I mean, musicians, like the Rolling Stones, they, will, they, would, they wouldn't contemplate retiring. Who, who would have thought that? Poets don't retire. Novelists don't retire. There's a lot of people who, if they haven't had the chance to express their creativity in some of those areas, who can take up unpaid music, or some paid other jobs in quite new areas. So I think one dynamic is for people who are in that second or third sub-cohort to encourage others reaching perhaps the age when they qualify for a superannuation payment to look at being a bit more brave and try new things, both voluntary but also remunerated to put a value on what mature people can offer. Yeah. Thank you, Lyle. It's very powerful words. Joyce, and then Isaac, and then Hans. Joyce, you're on mute. There we go. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, first, I had the privilege of, uh, of meeting with excuse me, with uh, Barry and his wife, although Barry had to leave for a meeting. So we had a great conversation. And of course, she's in Minneapolis and there's so much that has gone on in Minneapolis. We always use them nationwide as, as a role model. So uh, we were getting caught up on what was happening in Minnesota, talked about age-friendly cities, uh, talked about what, what's happening there. But then it transitioned to, and it actually relates to the question that Isaac put in the, in the chat and that you've been talking about more recently, and that's what's going on in companies. And one of them are setting up intergenerational teams within companies so that younger workers are advocating for the older workers because the older workers don't want to be let go and don't want to be seen as the old guy and, and so on and be left out of meetings, et cetera. So we found that what one, one thing that works is that whole intergenerational teamwork 
within companies. And if you have any interest in that, just go on and look at leveraging intergenerational leadership. And there are a number of United States companies and probably in your countries as well, and just see who is doing what. And there you'll find the names of company and uh, names of companies or organizations. Here, Harvard University up in Boston, Mass, has led that whole uh, trend toward intergenerational leadership within companies. And it's a way to have younger workers advocate for older workers and begin to look at how do you leverage when you've got old equipment and you've got older workers who worked on that back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there's value add that isn't being utilized. And there are a number of other opportunities that show up and vice versa, how older people can coach and mentor, et cetera, younger workers, because you're gonna be the next tier of leadership. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Linda is recommending a, a book in the chat called Five Generations in the Workplace. And I want to uh, uh, ask uh, Isaac to uh, come online and, and ask your question. All right. Hello, yeah. everyone. Um, let's see. Let me scroll back up. So, yeah. So, um, with my question, uh, I was just wondering, you know, as we have these discussions and, uh, like, uh, some folks have said before, uh, Joyce and Ingle, um, about, uh, how aging looks like at the moment, but also how it might look like in, in, you know, maybe not the distant future, but also just the near future maybe within the next uh, five, 10 years. Um, so what I was wondering was, um, because aging is a, is a constant process, and of course, as the world changes around us, and as, you know, events happen, and, and as uh, things happen in our lives that may shift us to go in one direction, or, or to think about life in different ways, um, how do we and this is, I'm asking the world this question, so uh, I'm very curious to hear what other people would have to say, but um, I'd be very curious to um, chip away at that, how how we would uh, engage and think about aging, not so much as uh, a, a thing that occurs and then it happens, but rather as a constant process as like we've like we've talked about before how um with every years with every year that goes by more and more people are being added to this growing number of of uh older uh people of the world so i'd be very curious to to understand that more because like like we talked about before if if we're able to understand what it means to progressively grow older as the world around us changes and how that in turn might change how we view aging um i'd be curious to then see how we could all collaborate in that sense because like um a few folks have mentioned before how uh uh how the people who may not be a part of the older generations or maybe considered the older generations today will be the older generations of the future right M myself included um, so yeah, I, I would love to um, discuss that because as as we've we've as many people have rightly pointed out, it's it can't be something that's delineated very strictly. It, it, it ebbs and flows, and and people feel different ways uh, as the years go by. There are events that shape us how how we see ourselves in our in our communities. So yeah, my question's sort of related to that of of the sort of fluctuating nature of, of, of aging as time progresses. Well, thank you, Isaac. This is a big question. And I'd like to just pinpoint something here. Uh, we actually looking at, with, with your question, we're looking at uh, two different topics. One is complete, what, we, what in the public discourse is called intergenerational people over 60 with people under 60. That is something that we actually hope to speak about uh, later in the year, much more uh, in more details. 
Today, the focus is a little bit about how not to look at people over 60 as a monolith. And, and uh, from what I've, I've been said here uh, all in the past hour is that people over 60 are not monolith. Maybe they're not defining themselves uh, based on chronological age, but they are defining themselves about their vitality, their interests, their passions. Uh, but yes, also uh, their ability to move about and, and, and do the things they want to do freely. Uh, freely meaning free of uh, uh, physical limitations. And within that group, we have many, many variables and we can leverage that uh, and help people who are younger than 60 observe that and know that, any, that not everybody over 60 is old. Uh, so let's let's stay for today's conversation in unpacking that uh, so-called monolith into what it really is. Um, yeah, just one thing, Lyle, I'm gonna get to you in a minute. I just want to say we are going to uh, close this session formally the 15 minutes after the hour and continue it, keeping it for another 15 minutes for all the things that didn't get to be said. Uh, Lyle, uh, you're going to go next. I'm going to ask Moira to bookend this conversation after that. And then at 15 minutes after the hour, we will close formally and uh, move on to our fantastic post conversation conversation. So Lyle, all yours. Oh, thanks, Osman. Now, just just uh, how you frame today's session, what you just said, reminds me to, it's not just that group you're talking about where we apply uh, rather vague generalizations, but a lot of the generational stuff, talking about generation uh, Z and, and millennials and X and so forth, have the same issue that while they might have some limited use, Actually, in the end, you've got to get at the individuals and be careful about weighting too much any generational label. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but we're selfish. We're looking at us. You know, <laughs> the, the, the thing is, the thing is, is, is that generational Z and Y and all those other letters uh, a lot of them fall within the zero to 45. And we still distinguish within that uh, continuum that we have that generation, that generation, they all have the specific characteristics that lots of uh, digital and uh, actual ink has been sp uh, spilled on. But 60 to 100? I'm, I'm uh, resting my case here. It is always looked as a monolith. People over 60, just look at the uh, academic uh, papers. They stop at 64 or uh, all kinds of surveys by the industry. It's, it's beginning to change, but it's always up to 65 and over. Mm -hmm. And and I think what we're doing here today is that saying that it is not a monolith. And I'm going to pass it on to Moira to say a few book ending remarks, and then I'll tell you what's next month. Right. Uh, th thank you, Osnet. You know, I'd just like to mention something that I heard uh, Dr. Bill Thomas saying, and it made a huge impression on me. And I would like to leave that thought with you because I agree with everything that we've said around here. We're not a monolithic block. We individuals and in our heads, we still, you know, more of 35 or more of 40. I don't, <laughs> and I'm sure you're all the same for that. But uh, Dr. Bill Thomas said the following thing. He said that from the time you are born and you come out of your mother's womb and you get that first clap on your back oh, and you go, oh, you take your first breath. You have two imperatives in life and those imperatives are growth and development. And they remain with you throughout your life until you breathe your last breath. And I think the issue that we're dealing with now as pioneers in this new stage of life, because as all the stats that Osnat has pointed out, 
is that we haven't come to terms with what our development and growth goals are or, or, or imperatives are in this latter stage of life. And that is our job today, it is to find our own personal growth and development um, goals or objectives or what what is required of us. You know, especially at this time um, in history, which we are living through at the moment, it's unprecedented in every single aspect. So what is our role as older people today? What is our role with regard to ourselves? What is our role with regard to our society and especially to all the other generations? And um, I'd just like to close by saying that we at, at uh, Pass It On Network stand for a world for all ages. Everybody has their place and everybody has their role and their to, to play. That's what I would like to say. And that's what we all like to say. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Moira. I'd like to say thank you to all of you for being here in the last, in the past hour and change. Um, I'm going to put in the chat in a minute a link to our survey. We'd like to know what you thought about your experience today and what you'd like to hear about in future uh, sessions. It, we are going to have a recording available on the YouTube channel. In fact, what we do is uh, by the end of the week, you're going to receive a document, another mail, with highlights of what happened today with a link to the recording, with some uh, links to all kinds of other references with the chat transcript. transcript. And uh, please open it and read it, send it to others if you like. And also, also, can I can I come in with a, with a small anecdote? Yes, uh, sure. There is, there is something that uh, I have uh, uh, thought about quite a lot since I got first with his first, I got myself this question, are you still working? Hmm. Think about it. Uh, I was 55 or something like that when I got this, oh, are you still working? And I said, wow, <laughs> yes, of course. And uh, and my opinion is that, that you should, you should uh, never take that lightly if somebody tells you, have you stopped working? Because I haven't. I've 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 had a lot of jobs, different jobs, and I had stopped jobs, and I I've, I've ended jobs, and I have retired, but I haven't stopped working. Not activity. I I will never stop working. I think that is a something that we should keep in mind. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. That's Jan, yeah, that's Jen's uh, meaningful work, paid or unpaid, through the last breath. That's our founder, co-founder, Jen Hively's mantra and boy keep proving it <laughs> yes and keep it in mind keep it in mind because uh, uh, in by 2050 we'll be one and a half uh, million people over a hundred never stop working yeah. but next month next month uh, those of you who are on our mailing list saw that we sent another survey out and thank you those who answered the uh, responded to the survey this survey came up because practically in 90 percent of the sessions somebody brings up the the, the concept of uh, aging and spirituality and i said okay it must be important so we're going to find out from our pioneers what they think about it and we sent a survey around with four questions like this one many of you answered and now it's time to digest it and figure out uh, what's the best way to represent the responses. So many thoughtful responses there. And um, uh, so we're going to, in, on like our next session is the 11th of November, and we're going to dig, dig deeper in what spirituality and aging actually means. Hopefully you'll be here. And uh, we'll see what, what emerged from the survey and what can emerge from the conversation not unlike what we had today. And we now we close formally and we're going to leave this session open for another 15 minutes or anything that didn't get to be said. And all you need to do is raise your hand, your digital hand and 
Um, I would I would really like to hear from Richard from Kenya. This is his first time that Richard's come to one of our sessions, and it'd be lovely just to have a word from him. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, you're right. It's my first time to be on this space. And unfortunately, I joined late. But I have enjoyed every bit. I was in a group with uh, two other friends. A very nice discussion about the 60 to 74 and those beyond. I didn't contribute much, but as I listened to everybody else, it's a very interesting discussion because in Kenya, I am the founder of an organization that works with older persons. Our organization is called Age Watch Africa Foundation. And Age Watch is one of the 16 global network members of Health Age International in Kenya. Out of the 16 global network members, I am probably the oldest. I'm turning 62 in December. The rest are younger people. They are those who are as young as in their middle thirties who are also founders of organizations that are working with older persons. And, and so the point here is you can see a lot of interest even from those who are below 60 already getting interested in that age cohort, which to me is a good thing. The challenge that we have is so much around what the governments are doing, mostly in Africa and in Kenya in particular. We are about 50 years old, independence. But this is the time that the civil society is pushing the government to put down the first legislation that will regulate healthy aging in the country. That has come with lots of its drawbacks. And so, yeah, I have enjoyed the moment that I've been on. I think I want to hear more. I look forward to joining the next session. I will try my best to join in good time so that I can be able to contribute. But today I thank everyone for giving me a chance to join and and to learn from, from the presentations that are being made. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Michelle, you have your hand up. Unmute myself. I th I think, Maura, you, you hit on the problem that we have, and that is that we are trying to find a label or divide ourselves into, into groups, but, but we're not. It's, it's all about, as you said, con continued growth and development goals. I think one of the problems that we're struggling with is saying, well, should we divide it into 60 to 65, you know, 70 to 75 or something like that, or, or we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be divided. We shouldn't be labeled. Um, and I think that's, we're trying to find out who we are and we're trying to find a label and we shouldn't, we shouldn't be labeled. I don't, I don't know how to progress with that, but I think that that's part of our problem is we're, we're trying to find a label for ourselves. We've got, as you were saying last night, we've got, you know, all these generations, X, Y, Z, what, 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 whatever they are out there. And, um, and even that doesn't define what they are. Um, because there's so much um, uh, diversity in even within those generations, so I, I think I think that's what I think that's a struggle, and I think we need to to focus on that struggle about not having not having a label and yet and yet saying who we are. So it might sound a little muddled, but I just felt that that you you spoke to that problem more right there. Thank you. I was wondering if uh, Peter, who came in late, would like to greet us. Peter, we're happy to see you.
Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, sitting in the medical school, having just met with some deans and the provost, so I was late. Let me just pick up the conversation. Uh, the, of the person who was talking about labels, apologies for not knowing your name. I think that's very important. I was looking for the chat uh, to say, how about human beings? And even that's not quite enough in today's age. How about living creatures? Um, I'm a doctor. We like to label people. Earlier, somebody raised the issue of Alzheimer's or dementia. We, the labels are very powerful. We can't do without them. But we constantly have to ask ourselves, is this a label that's helping or hurting? For example, to be provocative, I would say the label Alzheimer's is outdated. And, um, and it's hurting more than it's helping because it leads to false expectations. So going back and concluding my comment, and thank you for inviting it, I do intergenerational work in schools and everywhere with my grandkids. The most important thing, I think, is to, to, to see them as creatures. I mean, I like Bill Thomas, but it's not all about growth and development, or it's not about growth. Growth and development is destroying the world. We have to develop and get bigger and progress. Spiritual growth, yeah. development well, yeah. in, in dimensions that are uh, broader than we often think are is, is, is important, and uh, I endorse that. So, sorry, I, I was a bit long-winded, but thank you very much for inviting it. Good. Adele, what's on your mind? I wanted to build a little bit upon what Michelle said. And also, I'm not quite sure if I heard Moira correctly when she referred to herself uh, as a as a 45-year-old or a 35-year-old as though being her real age is not a good thing. Oh, no, not at all. Okay, good. Um no. I, I think that numbers, the ages we are, are labels. And regrettably, society has a connotation of what does 75 look like? What does 85 look like? What does 90 look like? How often has someone said, for Lyle perhaps, you're 83, you don't look 83, Lyle. What does 83 supposed to look like? <laughs> you know? What does 86 supposed to look like? What does 41 supposed to look like? It's we just are who we are. And we should celebrate the fact that we are getting older. And uh, thank you. Yes. Or you look good for your age. Yes. Like, well, what, the, what does that mean? You look good for your age. Um, you know, by by ninety, are you supposed to look shriveled and old, like like the crone out of the Wicked Witch of the East, or whichever one she came from? Um, I think that we need to. I think, but by as vintagers, as I like to call us, not older people, but vintagers. I think it is up to us to demonstrate that getting older should not be feared, that the, we do not have to lose agency, that we are still competent and capable, able to make decisions for ourselves, that we can speak up and advocate for ourselves, those of us who choose to. I recognize that there are some people who are quite happy to have others advocate for them. And we cannot impose our own beliefs on others. We have to let others be the way they are. But we don't have to let other beliefs that, oh, you're older. You should sit back now, dear, and just let us take care of you. Like, no, thank you. So ages are labels in and of themselves. And, and we shouldn't try and say, oh, I feel like a 65-year-old. What does a 65-year-old feel like? I feel like I'm 75. I am 75. That's great. So that's that's my thought. You know, time flies. Time flies in many more than more than just uh, 
the birthdays that we celebrate. Uh, it's also almost time to finish this call. This is last chance for anybody to say what they wanted to say and didn't have a chance to say. You have one minute to say it. Sheila, you have? I, I have a, a very brief story, which I always tell. When I started the festival in 2011, the brochure said Legacy Film Festival on Aging. And we didn't get as many people. It was a three-day fest um, in a theater as I expected. So somebody said, well, you need a PR person. So we had a PR person come up and she looked at the brochure. Probably you've heard this story of mine. And she said, take that word aging off there. And I just started laughing because I said, that's the point. For God's sakes, what are we afraid of? And um, so since then I have kept the word aging and it has become a more popular word, not because of me, but because of the number of people who are aging in the world. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. This is always such a good story. And um, yes, we're all aging. And uh, we need support ourselves and support others in whatever way we can. And thank you for being pioneers and being mm -hmm. part of Passito Network. Thank you for being here today. Hopefully we'll see you on the 11th of November next month when we dig into our survey about spirituality and aging. <laughs>